Matthew chapter 4. We'll be looking at verses 5 through 11, the second part of last week's study. We looked at the first temptation of three last week, dealing with provisions or food as Jesus was asked to turn stones into bread to use his authority, his sonship, as Satan approached him and said, since you are the son of God, why don't you just, uh, you know, say a few words and take these stones and turn them into bread and just go ahead and and eat. And of course, Jesus responded with the word of God that uh, we're not to do that. We're to trust in the Lord. We're to allow God to provide for us and not think that we can provide for ourselves. This week, we'll look at the other two temps or testings of the devil himself with Jesus and one is of fame and the other is of power now these three three things we're always dealing with on a regular basis right we're always worried about where we're going to eat how we're going to pay our bills how we're going to survive and then we're always worried about what people think about us you know do they like me on Facebook on Instagram you know why don't they like I got one like something's wrong here you know I I want at least 15 Uh, and especially when you look at others and there's like 150 you know, on there, or millions, if it's a, a real good post, or on Instagram. And then power, of course. Uh, we always want to be in control. We want to be first. Uh, we want to be respected. You know, we want to be above others and so forth. So those are three things that we all deal with. And so we'll talk about uh, the last two this morning. And then how to battle the enemy uh, against those things in our lives. Because as believers... If we call ourselves Christians, uh, we are to be like Christ. That's what the word means. And so we want to be like Christ. Uh, We want to trust in God that he provides for us. Uh, We want to know that it's not about fame. It's about humility and being humble and not proud. And it's not about power and authority. Uh, For Jesus was even submitted unto the Father. And so we're submitted unto unto him. And and walking in that way, uh, you become a sweet person. You just do. People are drawn to you because you have such a neat personality, such a humble personality. Uh, I've I've experienced, as you have, uh, n- nothing against older ladies, you know, or anything like that, but sometimes you get bitter old ladies, and boy, when you run into a bitter old lady, whoo, man, you might as well run, <laughs> you know, just run. We don't want to be bitter. You know, we want to be humble. We want to reflect Christ and His love and His, His grace. So, so how do we battle against the enemy? Well, obviously, it's the Word of God. And, and the Word of God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Wait a minute, Pastor, that's a misquote. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And you're correct in saying that if you thought that. But isn't Jesus the Word of God? John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Logos, the Word of God in in flesh. And so the Word of God, which will never pass away, the Bible's clear that this Word will not pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but not one little dot will pass away. And if you look at a a Hebrew scroll, you will find that that scholars uh, painstakingly wrote every word exactly. And if they made one little mistake, they threw the whole scroll away and they started over. So that that every word of God was written on there exactly. Even the little dots and the little points on the Hebrew language, not one of those will disappear. That's how important the word of God is. It's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It's relevant. It was relevant in the past. It's relevant for us today. And it will be relevant in the future. Last week, we we left off in verse 4 there. As I mentioned, Jesus said, as he answered Satan, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And that is the word of God. So how important is the word? It's very important. Very important. I ran into someone this morning at Starbucks. Usually Sundays, if we have the grandkids over, everyone wants to go with me. To church because they know I always stop off at Starbucks first and so they know they get to order their little kids frappuccino or chocolate or you know whatever and so forth and they start at well can we order some food I'm like hey hold on there <laughs> do you know how much a little frappuccino costs <laughs> I'll do that but food forget that and so they all come with me so I had three girls uh, this morning with me uh, when we went there but there's this one lady there 
that's kind of been asking us some questions and so we've just been slowly ministering to her and there's another gal that works at the, that actually goes to uh, Raul Reese's church so just, she's just kind of getting it everywhere and all of a sudden she says I want to go to church and so uh, I stopped her today and she said yeah I'm going to church and I bought my first Bible I'm like I remember that day when I got my first Bible how exciting it was and I read through the whole thing in six months by the way now if you knew me I wasn't a reader when I was in school, forget it, forget English, for, forget history, forget all that stuff. Just give me P.E., let me have fun, that's all I care about. Never read a book in my life. Uh, my wife will tell you that. My language tells you that, you know that. So, <laughs> but this word, man, there was something about it that I just, I ate it up. I loved it, I was hungry for it. I just read a quote, it says, if you're not hungry for the word, you're full of something else. Ooh. And this quote was, you're full of self. So we need to be hungry for the word of God. She was hungry for the word. And then I asked her, you know, if I can encourage you to find a church that teaches through the word. Not a church that's topical. Nothing wrong with topicals. It's nice to have topical studies. But you need a church that teaches through the Bible. I mean, you just bought your first Bible. And this Bible is God's word. And everything that he has spoken to us is right here. And then you go to a church that doesn't even open it up and read through it. That doesn't make sense to me. She looked at me like, wow, that makes perfect sense. And she's started to go to a church, but she's open to going to other churches that does do just topical. I mean, you become a, a scholar in raising families, and that's wonderful. But, but how does, does the rest of the word apply? And then how is the context of the word? And, and what's the character of God? And, and, and so forth. It just kind of brings everything together as to why we're even here and what is important in life. So the word of God is very important. And so... Satan knows that, and he will tempt the king, which is our theme this morning, with the word of God also. <clears throat> so let's look at verse 5. Then the devil took him, that is Jesus, up into the holy city. Now Matthew's the only one that says holy city, and he's speaking of Jerusalem there, uh, there in Israel. And he set him on a pinnacle of the temple there. Now notice a couple of things here uh, as we go through this, is that, that the devil took him. The word took implies that he took alongside himself, Jesus. So, so you get this picture that as the devil is conversing with Jesus, he kind of grabs him by the hand in a sense, whether he did or not, we don't know, but he, he kind of took him and said, let's go over here. And, and he goes to a high place, a, a, a pinnacle there, and, and he brings and leads the Jesus. It's the same word that, that is used when Jesus took the disciples up to the Mount of Transfiguration. He literally said, come with me and let's go up to this place. And of course, we know that they experienced uh, something spectacular i mean life changing the, the father's voice and, and acknowledgement of the son but i thought it was interesting that the devil took jesus and and, and you have to ask uh, how many people have the devil taken with him you know, how many people actually follow the devil as he leads now you might think that's a little crazy who follows the devil or at least who, who outright vocalizes i follow the devil you know you got to be you know maybe a, a saint satanic cultist you know wearing black all over and so forth and i can understand that but normally people say no i don't follow the devil i don't take his lead you know i'm, I'm not a devil worshiper and, and i would probably say you probably aren't but a lot of people are following him when you really think about it <clears throat> the religious leaders hated jesus and, and they kept telling Jesus, you're of the devil, because you bring this strange teaching. We're of our fathers of the Old Testament, the patriarchs, Abraham, King David. Uh, Moses brought us the law, and we follow it. And they had this idea that they were following their ancestors, but they weren't. Jesus made it very clear in 844 that you are of your father, the devil, now, how many would ever do that to someone? Kind of as you're talking with them and they might be a religious person and then pretty much say, no, you know what? You're of your father, the devil. <laughs> that was like, oh, you want to fight? Okay, let's, let's go for it. You know, that's basically what you're doing. But Jesus just right up front, you're of the devil. Your father's the devil. You're children of the devil. That's the implication there, right? And he goes on and explains why that is. This is what he said. The desires of your father you want to do. The devil has certain desires. And those desires are to kill Jesus. 
Those desires are to preach lies and falsehoods. These religious leaders are following in his tracks. Having the same desires of, of Satanism, in a sense. You see later on that the Satan is the God of this world, the Bible says. Now, when he says the God of this world, he's not talking about the world and the people in it. He's talking about a system, a, a philosophy that's in the world. And, and you can see this philosophy throughout uh, various cultures, even various uh, hierarchies, whether it's corporations and so forth, the love of money. You can see that threaded through a lot of different things. Uh, pride, I mean, just these three, three things, you know, provisions, and fame, you know, and power. And it's all threaded through. This is the world system. There's a system that, that is functioning here, and he's in charge of that system. And Jesus is saying, you're following in that system. The sin of the system. When, when Paul lists the, the works of the flesh, and, and I'm not going to quote them all completely, but there, there's a work of the flesh of being a drunkard. You know, that's in the system. Adultery in the system. Cheating in the system. Lying in the system. You know, fornication in the system. That, that is uh, living with someone without being married. This is all in the system. And, and the system is looked at as good by people. What's wrong with those things? Everyone lies in the corporations. Everybody cheats. They expect you to cheat. Everyone's living with everyone. So what is the big deal? And we look at it that way, but it's the world system because God says the opposite to that. So he's saying, your desires of your father, and you want to do that. And he says to them, to them Jesus, you're murderers from the beginning. He was a murderer, so you're murderers. Jesus later on will say that hatred is murder. In other words, in your heart, you want to murder someone. You ever feel like that sometimes? Someone really gets you upset. Get a hold of them, I just kill them. That's murder. And what you're saying is, if there was no laws, and I could hold a gun in my side, and we came looking at each other face to face, whoever's the quickest dies, you know, boom. We would probably do something like that. It'd be easy to murder, but that's their heart. They wanted to murder Jesus. And Jesus said, that's what Satan wants to do. That's why you're of your father, the devil. Another thing he says, uh, he does not stand in truth. He does not stand in truth. That's very important. Standing in truth. Well, where is truth? And what is truth, Pilate said. And today we, we say truth is relative, depending on who you are, where you grew up, and so forth. And that's lies. Right here's the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. The truth is right here. And, and what this says is true. You either believe it or you don't. And I find that a lot of people don't believe it. They, they, they have a b belief that Jesus is who he said he was, and he's brought us good moral values, but, but the inside doesn't reflect that. They don't allow it to enter in, and then they don't allow it to flow forth. And that's what we would probably call false Christianity, because there has to be a change. You need to be born again. You become a new creature in Christ Jesus. And so the conviction of sin, the world system, the conviction, conviction of, of what is truth is there. And, and when you find what truth is, you, you want to live that truth, because you know it's what he wants you to do. You don't want to live the lie because in the lie you're destroyed. You're consumed. And that's why we have so many struggles even in our own relationships. And then when he speaks, he says, of Satan, he speaks from his own resources. Uh, another example of what Satan is. His own resources. In other words, his own wisdom, his own knowledge, his own word. Not God's word but his own word. We'll see that he actually takes God's word and he changes it to fit his need. We shouldn't do that. From his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. And so because you act like him, you follow him, you're, you're of your father the devil, he said. Jesus said the opposite of children. He said, let your light so shine before men that they, when they see your good works, they glorify their father in heaven. That's a child of God, that he does good works from the word of God. And when he does those good works, he reflects his father and people are drawn to the father, not to him for fame, but to the father. The gal that just sang up here, I can't remember her name right now, but wasn't she? The Lord just has blessed her with such a beautiful voice. What a beautiful gift. And what a humble gal that she is. And drawing no attention to herself and just leading you to worship her God 
That's the whole purpose of all of that. Not, not, not trying to get up there and say, hey, look at me or anything like that. But humbly saying, I'm here to serve God. And, and that's why they came, to serve God. Oh, I, first time I met her today, she came to this church, you know, and, and she came to just serve the Lord and so forth, asking for nothing but just to be used of God. That's the attitude that we have to have, reflecting and shining and letting God shine through us, and thus God gets the glory. God gets the glory for it. And that's where we want the glory to go. Yet, we see here that Satan may be taking Jesus, but yet it's the leading of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus. Why? I think that God wants to show us that Jesus did it. That that he was tempted in every point, like Hebrews says, and we have a priest that that understands our temptations and our failures, in in a sense. He understands us completely. I find it interesting because when you look at this passage, 11 verses of Jesus being tempted, and, and this battle between the Creator, Jesus, because Colossians tells us that He created all things that exist, everything And here's Satan again coming up to him, and we're going to see later on that he's going to ask Jesus to worship him. That's that's ludicrous. That is crazy. Uh, The created being telling the Creator, would you worship me? You know, doesn't make any sense. We usually worship cars. We don't ask the cars to worship us. We, We make the cars. The cars don't turn around, now worship me. But we end up worshiping it, don't we? Now, isn't it interesting because when you go before time, before the creation of the world, there's a picture in Isaiah chapter 14 of God sitting on his throne and Lucifer, the shining light. And in this conversation, he's fallen. And he wants to be like God. And you have the I wills. I will be like you. I will be above you. I will. He wants to be God. He wants worship is what he wants. And so the same thing is happening here. Now, he's cast down to earth by the Father because of this, and he's slithering around the earth, hiding under rocks. God creates the earth. He puts man on the earth, and here he goes, slithering right up to Eve, and he does the same thing. He begins to bring doubt to her with the same temptations as we saw last week of provisions of fame and power. And you can have all these, but he doesn't want you to have them. But I'll let you have them if you come and worship me in a sense. And now here he is with Jesus. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't change. He's the same. He has one purpose, and that is to be worshipped by man and to destroy you completely. That's his whole purpose. So, the Spirit is leading him, though, because Jesus will be victorious. And we have a Savior that has the power and the authority and the strength to be victorious, and we can trust in Him. He set him on a pinnacle of the temple there. The word pinnacle in the Greek is defined as little wing. Now, when you go to Jerusalem and you're looking from the Mount of Olives down, you'll, you'll see these great walls surrounding the holy city. And on the south eastern side there is a high point and there was a, a an area built there by herod that's even higher they say somewhere between 300 and 300 to 350 feet above the kidron valley that, that runs between the mount of olive and old uh, jerusalem there, just down quite a quite a ways down you definitely can see it 350 feet that's like a 25 foot story building that he brings them up to so that he can see everything uh, when i was there on Mount of Olives. It's amazing how you can see the, the Dome of the Rock, which is there today. It wasn't there during the time of Christ. Uh, <clears throat> the, the temple walls that, that were around. And then you can see the City of David, which was to the southern part. Kidron Valley down. And you see all these tombs on the side of the valley. That was where they threw their trash. They would take all their garbage and trash and throw it there and then just kind of let it burn. And so when Jesus says that, that hell is like uh, a fire that's not quenched and the, where the worms don't die, that's what the Kidron Valley was. A part of it was just a wasteland and they just continued to fed it. And so he referenced it to what hell was like. So he brings them to this high place and we have the second temptation, verse 6. And he said to him, if you are the Son of God or since you are the Son of God, and there's the temptation again, since you have authority, since you have power, I, I, I used to watch the faith and wealth ministry, and I, I don't want to offend anyone that, that's in that ministry at all, but here's the truth. I was, in fact, I was just watching it the other day. 
And, and there was a, a guy on there, Hispanic guy, and he was talking about healings and how healings is there if you just have the faith and you just believe it because you're a child of God. And he brought this one lady up, says, you're healed. You have faith. And she started quoting scripture. Oh, you, you got it. You got the faith. Just say it now. Now start running. And she's running. He stops her. Do you have any pain? She goes, just a little bit right here. Okay, just say it again. I'm a child of God and healing's there, you know. Just say it again. She'd run again in place. It's still pain? Just a little bit. Oh, you're getting it. You'll get it. You'll get it. And he goes off to someone else. That's what Satan's doing here. If you are, or since you are the Son of God, use your power and authority to meet your needs, to bring fame to yourself, to establish yourself as the Messiah in a sense here. Throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. He's using scripture right here. Does Satan use scripture? Yes, he does. Does he use it well? Yes, he does. Does it work? Yes, it does. Because people eat some of this stuff up. I was going to say garbage. Some of the garbage up that's out there. They do. Why? Because you're not reading the Word of God. You're not in it. You're not studying it. And you're not checking when someone says something. Because if you check, you'll find that there's an error in their interpretation. <clears throat> How many have met somebody that says, judge not, lest you be judged? You, know, you, you, know, you start judging them. You know what? Your lifestyle isn't quite the way it should be you know you need to repent and turn back to God. that's a good thing they love you enough to tell you that you're wrong you're headed down the wrong path so turn around and come back you can't judge me the bible says and they always the bible says judge not least you be judged keep reading <laughs> there's more to that it's, it, and then it goes on and says when you judge judge rightly if there's a speck in your brother's eye get the beam out of your own eye first and then remove the speck. So what God is saying is you can judge. Just judge it rightly. Judge with, with gentleness, with grace and mercy. Judge so that you restore someone and not condemn someone is what he's saying here. We're fruit inspectors. That's what we are. We can't condemn anybody. Well, in this world, Jesus said in John chapter 3, the world's already condemned, so we can't condemn any, anyone at all that's a non-believer. They're condemned already without Christ. What we can do is offer them hope, and restoration, that's our job to do that. But to judge, and you've all heard that one, so that, that is so misquoted all the time. It's just so interesting. So the, te the devil tempts Jesus to use his power from God to attract attention to himself, to draw fame to himself. He knows Jesus' plan to a certain degree. He knows that, 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 that God has a plan for Jesus, that ultimately he, he is going to be known as the Messiah. So he says, let's do it together. It's a good thing, right? You want to be known as the Messiah. You want people to, to know who you are. You want people to be drawn to you. So let's do that. Throw yourself off the building and you make a splash. And boy, you'll be a smash hit. Everybody will love you. Everybody will love you. They'll all see the angels coming and lifting you up and carrying you to safety. Boy, they'll, they will know you are the Messiah. But that wasn't God's plan. He has to die for the sins of the world. He has to take the iniquities and the punishment of it all. God has a greater plan than just being known as the Messiah and meeting your needs at this moment. So greater, but we miss that. So this testing is on fame. <clears throat> Satan wants fame. He wants to be lifted up above others. I think the church sometimes wants fame. I, I was sharing this morning about the new swing set, if you saw it out there. Uh, the kids loved it. Uh, we were here yesterday, three and a half hours to put it together. But I started posting pictures on Facebook. And in my mind, and I struggle with this, this is one of my biggest struggles, is, is am I doing this for the right reasons? Am I doing this for the right reasons? And you might say, well, what's wrong with, with posting it and let people know that God's blessing the church? And there isn't anything wrong with that. But is that my reason? Or am I trying to let people know, hey, look what God's doing here. You know, you should come over here and not over there. Is that my reason? So I, I go back and forth with this stuff. And I've just learned that, that that's my flesh. And I may be doing it for that reason. But I'll go ahead and do it anyway. And let God be the judge. Because I don't even know if that's the reason or not. Why do you put pictures on Facebook? You know, and they're 
<laughs> you know, like that. You know, why? Are you trying to draw attention? Trying to get fame? People like? If I can get more likes than my other friend, they like me more than her. You know, that type of thing? That's sin. That's something the Bible says that God doesn't want in our lives. He wants us to draw attention to who? To Christ. And Christ in us. As he just said, be a light. And let people see your good works that it can reflect your Father in heaven. And they're drawn to him. But they're drawn to you. And the conversation is never about Christ. I think Facebook is good in the sense that we can use it to share scriptures. I see a lot of good scriptures on there. And so forth. And family. It does connect. We, I have someone here that Virginia and I, that went, we went to high school with them. You know, we connected because of Facebook, and we've connected to a lot of friends from Facebook, and it's amazing how many people are Christians. I'm blown away by that fact. I thought I was the only one, and my wife. But then you realize, boy, God really does work all over the world. And so it's neat to connect that way and then share that scriptures, and, and then you see how God uses it. I had a call uh, several months ago uh, from uh, another schoolmate. His name was Dave King, and he wanted to talk to me. And I thought he didn't know the Lord, so I'm like, yeah, opportunity. So I, I just drove all the way to Dana Point to, to talk to him and hopefully to share the gospel. And it turned out that he did know the Lord. And what was interesting, again, here's that thing. I'm in my head going, do I share this or not share this? Glory to God. Because he said, do you know people look at you in Virginia as examples of what God has done? Now, I'm not saying that because I want a big head. I'm saying that because God did that. And I told him, I said, that wasn't me. Because you don't know me in Virginia. <laughs> you don't know who we are. You know? You're not in the home with us. You know, she's chasing me around with a stick. And No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Glory to God if, if that's what you see. Uh, you know, we try to reflect that. And, and that's what we should do. And not draw attention or fame or power. And so the enemy wants to come to Jesus and say, look, forget the cross. Forget the death. Just get the fame right now. You're the Messiah. You're the Son of God. Use it. Come on. I'm the campaign manager. We'll set it out there and people will come from all over the place. With fame comes responsibility, right? I think we need to understand that if you're a person that is in, a, in, a, in the limelight in a sense, you know, if you're a person that's out there, you need to have that responsibility. Of all the years that I've been in ministry, I've known the Lord now coming on 30 years, I've seen ministries come and go. I've seen big hooplas, you know, this is the latest thing, you know, and then all of a sudden it dies out. And what I see that is consistent is this, just teaching through the Word of God, simply drawing people together. Because Calvary Chapel is a name, but it's not about a name. Calvary Chapel, to those that are true Calvary Chapelites, it is a principle in a heart from the Word of God more than it is a name. People look at it as a name and so they go, well, I go to Calvary Chapel, uh, like, ooh. And I go to Calvary Chapel, uh, ooh. <clears throat> Good for you. <laughs> and I go to Calvary Chapel. <laughs> it is a name, but we need to be careful that we're not lifting the name up more than Christ because Chuck's heart was not to have a denomination. It's still not a denomination to this day. His heart was to reflect Christ. You know, of all the people that I've seen in ministries, and we see a lot of ministries out there, and you'll notice that their name, their personal name becomes the trademark. That's the brand. And so now you're pushing a name, and people know that name, and that name gets famous. Chuck never did that. He never pushed his name. In fact, if you were to sit down and talk with him, he shakes his head. I don't know why God's doing this. I have no idea. They'd always come up, okay, Chuck, what did you do to do this? I mean, because there's over 1,800 Calvary chapels worldwide. What did you do? And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> Just read through the word and let the spirit lead. That's all I did. He doesn't push his name at all. In fact, if anything, what does he do? If you've ever seen Chuck in the later days of life, if you see him at a conference and so forth, he's in a little go uh, golf cart, picking up papers, driving around, place to place. But you don't see those that have names doing that. Chuck did. In his earlier years, he was walking around the campus. Right before he was teaching, he was picking up papers and doing things because he had a servant's heart. And his name will probably go by the wayside compared to other names but that's what he wants. 
He wants Jesus to be made known. Whether it's a pastor, a worship leader, or a leader himself, whether it's his ministry or secular, <clears throat> we need to be careful uh, that we're not into it because of the fame and using our sonship uh, to get us there. So notice his quote. He quotes from Psalms 91. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. That is the part he left out, to keep you in all your ways. He just put, he'll give the angels charge over you and they shall bear you up in their hands lest you dash your foot against a stone. He left out the keep you in your ways. In other words, to fulfill God's plan for your life. He, didn't, he left that out. Forget the cross. You don't have to do the cross. Get the fame right now. And that's what Satan does. He comes as a, a, an angel of light. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen Transforms himself into an angel of light and then he begins to uh, misuse the word. He tries to trip you up by thinking, here's the word, but it's not the whole word. It's only part of the word. And if I can get you to believe that, then fine. You'll miss it. And that happens too much today. You probably have seen snake handlers on TV. Usually 2020 or one of those, those stations will talk about snake handlers, right? Those little churches in other states, small little states or backcountry wood places, you know, where the pastor is talking about. Mark chapter 16, you know, where they said if you drink or if you hold uh, something that bites, you know, a serpent, you know, that, that God will, will heal you and you won't die. So, so these guys take that and they're, they're handling snakes and passing it around. And once in a while someone gets bit and they all go, See if he dies. Sometimes he does. <laughs> Sometimes they do. Well, I guess he didn't have faith. He's not of God. You know? one, one pastor of Kentucky uh, began to pass around um, uh, cyanide. If you drink cyanide. So he ended up uh, getting a jail sentence because a couple of people died for, um, from it. And so manslaughter his place i mean they misuse it and, and he's skillful at it very skillful at it and he will convince you if, if you're not in the word of god look at what jesus said in verse seven it is written so this is a second time now and this word again the word again you can highlight that and, and you can probably put the emphasis there because again he's talking to satan he's already told him this is what the word says so now he says again i tell you again it's written. Again, God said. Again, it's right here before your eyes. Again, this is what the Bible says. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Very clear. So, so don't handle snakes because <laughs> you're tempting the Lord. Don't drink poison because you're tempting the Lord. Don't do silly things like that. Uh, enemy would love nothing better but to destroy you and, and kill you in those ways. Don't think about suicide. Don't tempt the Lord or hurting yourself. Don't tempt the Lord. The Lord has you right where you're at for a reason, for a purpose. Let His grace shine through you. I had ministered to a person uh, years ago. And from what I gathered, I didn't know this person. He wasn't a very nice person. Didn't live a godly life at all didn't know the Lord at all, was witness to. And I went and I shared with them. I couldn't speak because they were really sick and tears were coming down when I, I told them that God could forgive them of all their sins and that he loved them very much and just tears just coming down and he ended up accepting the Lord. He died shortly after. And someone asked, said, why? Why such a wasted life? There's no good that came out of his life at all. And then right at the last moment, God's grace comes down and saves him and he gets to go to heaven. People struggle with that. And I tell people, if anything, do you know what he was used for? To prove that God's grace can save anyone. That's pretty huge. Because if God's grace can save him with a wasted life, then God's grace can save me. That still have much life ahead of me. Right? He's not done. He's not done. So God uses every situation. And it might be that he's displaying his grace 
on your life at this moment and that's why you're going through the things you're going through. So let God's grace shine and trust in Him and reflect Him in your life. Let people know that. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Don't put God to a test. Now the third test, verse 8, the devil took him up on a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. So this next uh, temptation is on power. On power, from the presidency to, the, to cityhood. Uh, there are people that just seek power, power and, and want to repeat that power. We, we have that battle right now going on. We had the first African-American presidency, and people probably voted because they wanted to see that happen. And now we have an opportunity to put a woman into that president seat. But not just a woman, but also a first lady whose husband was also a president. Let's do that because it's the first time. And that's a good reason to put her in there, right? <laughs> that's a dumb reason to put her in there. We don't... Can I say that? No, I better not say that. <laughs> Especially we. I personally would not like to see her in there. There we go. That's my personal opinion. Would not like to see her in there. Not because she's a woman and not because she's a first lady, but what she represents. What she represents. That's what's important. What does she represent? Unfortunately, people don't get that. But people are always seeking power, seeking authority. I had a guy one time on a Wednesday night come here. Cowboy, big old hat, boots, shiny big belt. Sat through the whole message. And he came up afterwards. And he said, I could do way better than that. I've gone to seminary school, got my master's degree and blah, 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 and, and so forth. And I looked at him and I says, you know what? I agree with you. You probably could do a lot better than that because I'm nobody. But you have one problem. God called me to be the pastor here and you can't. Sorry. <laughs> so go find your own church and do as good as you want. <laughs> you <know? laughs> we all want power, even in ministry sometimes. You know, we, we own a ministry and we think, my ministry. I always picture that little cartoon with Daffy, is it? Daffy Duck, Donald Duck, or no, Daffy Duck. And he, he finds a pearl and he goes after the pearl. Mine, 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 mine. And he's just like hugging and saying, it's mine and you can't have it. You know, when we view ministry that way, it's not my ministry, it's God's ministry. And we're to reflect that accordingly. But sometimes we want the power. Here's my ministry. How come you're not noticing me? I'm way back here and I do all of this. There's so many ministries going on behind the scenes that we don't even know of that are great ministries. This ministry, unfortunately, is, is seen. And my rewards are, are, are little because of this, because my rewards are almost instant. When, as soon as you say, great job, I lost my reward. <laughs> you know, I lost it. it. It just came by that accolade towards me. I'd rather not hear that and just let it go up to heaven and, and let him decide at that moment, because he knows my heart, <clears throat> than to hear someone say that. The rewards are with those who do things behind the scenes and nobody knows what's going on. That, that one gift that, that you give and nobody knows and people are like, wow, God is so good. Who gave that? Because everyone wants to know. Who gave that? Who did that? Why do you want to know? God did. And God laid it on their heart to do it. And so who cares who did it? Give glory to God and then they get their rewards when they get to heaven. Those are the, the rewards. But no, we want the power or the authority even over things. Satan takes him up to this place and says, look, I'm the God of this world system. I own everything here. You want it? You want it? Come and get it. <clears throat> Listen to what he says. And he said in verse 9 to him, all these things I will give to you if you what? Fall down and worship me. Wow. Just worship me. Just come sit at my feet. Come and give your offerings to me. Don't give your offerings to the Lord. Don't support His work. But give your offerings to me, to my system. I really believe that personally. And I look at all of those things, just knowing what I want to invest in. Chuck has always taught, invest where the Spirit is moving, where God is at. United Way, God is not there. <laughs> yeah, they're doing very good things sometimes. And it's humanitarian things. But the Spirit isn't there. They're not getting saved. They're not coming to know the Lord. 
but at least their houses are paid off or they're rebuilt, you know, or, or, or they're given food or clothing and things like that. And that, that's okay. But the Lord isn't there. He's not investing in that. Invest in places that are giving food and building houses and sharing the gospel. Now that's something to invest in because it's active in the kingdom of God. Invest in those things that have heavenly rewards and not just superficial earthly rewards. Those things. And we do a lot of investing in a lot of things. Just had a young lady uh, just really wanting to know God's will. She's involved in PTA. She's like, I don't know if I should get out because I really don't like it anymore. These women are horrible. And I think I'm wasting my time. And I said to her, there's a time when you're casting your pearls before swines. Well, that's all they are. They're, they're just attacking you and killing you or bringing you down and flattering you up and boosting you here, but there's no spiritual significance whatsoever. And you're casting your pearls before swines. You have to ask yourself, where's the fruit? Is what they represent godly? And is that where God wants you? if you're casting your pearls before them. You know what casting your pearls before swines means? You know, when you take the gospel and you're giving it to someone and they keep telling you, no, I don't want it. Get out of here. Get out of my face. And you keep casting them. It's like taking beautiful pearls and saying, here, swine, pigs, enjoy it. And they look at you like, what? And I just chew on it. They don't care about it. Pearls are nothing to them. They might be valuable to you, but I don't care. I'll eat them. That's what pigs do. And there are people that don't want to hear the gospel, don't respect the gospel, be a part of the gospel. Fall down and worship me. The bait is sweet. And it is sweet at times when people give you the accolades and acknowledge you and so forth. And it might be easy to get puffed up a little bit. Be careful. Because a son of God cannot worship the devil. Satan wants that worship, but he can't get it. Let me read to you what, <clears throat> what he said in Isaiah fourteen thirteen. For I, For you have said in your heart, this is what God said the devil said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high God. We all worship someone. Who do you worship? That's the question. Because the way I see things, I don't see people worshiping my God from the Bible. Oh, no, but I believe in my God. Yeah, that's the problem, your God. It's your God, which ultimately is you are God, is what you're saying, because you make the rules. I was telling my granddaughters this morning, I said, and they're all from 8 to to 14, I said, I used to tell your daddies, because they're all my son's kids, when they were your age, that God makes the rules. And they go, yeah, we heard that, Poppy. God makes the rules. I go, yeah, and we're all under him, including me. So we have to follow his rules, not my rules. I don't make up the rules. God makes up the rules. And so those are the rules that I want to live under. And they're not even rules. They're standards and they're principles that keep us safe as believers. That's what they are because he loves us that much. But who's your God? Who are you worshiping? Is it really just you? Are you just worshiping yourself? Do you stand in front of the mirror? For it is written, for it is written, Jesus said. Four times he said that. It is written, it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Anyone between that uh, is idolatry. Him and him alone. Nobody else shall you worship. And then the devil left him. Behold, the angels came and ministered to him. I love that because when, when ministry gets tiring, uh, when it's difficult in life, you can always just get away and let the Lord minister to you. And you find times of refreshing and strength when you know that you fought the battle well with the sword, which is the word of God, against the enemy. Because that's exactly what Jesus did. He, he resisted the temptations of the devil and he fleed from him. He told him, get behind me or actually get out of here. Get out of here completely. That's how he battled the devil with scripture. And, and when he used scripture, Jesus used scripture correctly within its context. Because the devil quoted it out of context. And his submitting to the word of God gave him the victory over the enemy. (sighs) 
as I was preparing this, <clears throat> I asked the Lord, Lord, how do I, how do I take that truth and, and get it into their hearts? How do I get them to see the importance of the word of God and then being obedient to it? James says, don't just be hearers only, but be doers of the word of God. At least you deceive yourself. You deceive yourself when you're not doing the word of God. In the time of Jeremiah, he would come with the word of God. God would get, literally give him a word. Then he'd go and share that word and the people go, ah, nice. But they walk away and not do a thing about it. And that's where we're at today. We have true Christians who know who Jesus is and what he's done. And the reality of it has come forth from their hearts. Their lives have changed. People notice that in you. And you probably even have enemies because you will stand firm on the truth. Not like the devil. You will stand firm. And that makes enemies. People won't like you. When you say, no, I'm not doing that and you shouldn't be doing it, you're going to hell. Ah, yeah, that type of thing. But then there are those who know the truth of what Jesus did, but it hasn't done anything inside. How do I get there? How do I get at that? And the Lord said, you can't. That's my work. Only my work. You just present it and you just pray that God will take his word and somehow get it into the hearts of his people. And I hope that has gotten into your hearts the importance of the Word of God because Jesus battled the enemy and had victory because he submitted himself to the Word of God. And there's a lot of satanic twisting of the Word and you need to be careful of that. And the only way that you can is by reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God. Remember years ago they said, how do you know a counterfeit dollar? By looking at a real dollar, touching it, feeling it, watching it, how it wrinkles and how it the texture and how it smells and so forth. And when you get a counterfeit dollar, you go, hey, something's not right here. Why? Because you know what a real dollar feels like. We need to be in the Word of God. The Word of God is a sword, and it's a sword of the Spirit. And, it, and if it's rightly handled, it will defeat the enemy and his attempts to snare us into destruction. <clears throat> 